The Citizenship Clause is the first sentence of Section 1 in the Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which was adopted on July 9, 1868. It states that, "...all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside." This clause represented Congress's reversal of a portion of the Dred Scott v. Sanford decision which had declared that African Americans were not and could not become citizens of the United States or enjoy any of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 had already granted U.S. citizenship to all persons born in the United States, not subject to any foreign power. The 39th Congress proposed the principle underlying the Citizenship Clause due to concerns expressed about the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Act during floor debates in Congress. The framers of the Fourteenth Amendment sought to entrench the principle in the Constitution in order to prevent its being struck down by the Supreme Court or repealed by a future Congress. Text Section 1, Clause 1, of the Fourteenth Amendment, reads all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Naturalization The reference to naturalization in the Citizenship Clause is to the process by which immigrants are granted United States citizenship. Congress has power in relation to naturalization under the Naturalization Clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 of the Constitution. <inaudible> Senate debate The text of the Citizenship Clause was first offered in the Senate as an amendment to Section 1 of the Joint Resolution as passed by the House. There are varying interpretations of the original intent of Congress, based on statements made during the congressional debate over the amendment. While the Citizenship Clause was intended to define as citizens exactly those so defined in the Civil Rights Act, which had been debated and passed in the same session of Congress only several months earlier, the clause's author, Senator Jacob M. Howard of Michigan, phrased it a little differently. In particular, the two exceptions to citizenship by birth for everyone born in the United States mentioned in the Act, namely, that they had to be not subject to any foreign power, and not Indians not taxed, were combined into a single qualification, that they be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, and while Howard and others, such as Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lyman Trumbull of Illinois, the author of the Civil Rights Act, believed that the formulations were equivalent, others, such as Senator James R. Doolittle from Wisconsin, disagreed, and pushed for an alternative wording, there was no recorded debate over who was encompassed by the expression, not subject to any foreign power, or whether these same people were excluded by the wording of the Citizenship Clause. Howard, when introducing the addition to the amendment, stated that it was the law of the land already, and that it excluded only persons born in the United States who are foreigners, aliens, who belong to the families of ambassadors or foreign ministers. Others also agreed that the children of ambassadors and foreign ministers were to be excluded. However, concerning the children born in the United States to parents who are not U.S. citizens and not foreign diplomats, three senators, including Trumbull, as well as President Andrew Johnson, asserted that both the Civil Rights Act and the Citizenship Clause would confer citizenship on them at birth, and no senator offered a contrary opinion. Trumbull even went so far as to assert that this was already true prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act, although Senator Edgar Cowan of Pennsylvania, disagreed, arguing that this was only true for the children of European immigrants. Senator John Connus of California expressed support for the amendment for giving a constitutional basis for birthright citizenship to all children born in the United States to any parentage including Chinese non-citizen residents who do not intend to reside permanently in the United States, even though he and others thought it had already been guaranteed by the Act, whereas Cowan opposed the amendment and Act, arguing that it would have the undesirable outcome of extending citizenship to the children of Chinese and Romani immigrants. Most of the debate on this section of the amendment sent on whether the wording in the Civil Rights Act or Howard's proposal more effectively excluded Indians on reservations and in U.S. territories from citizenship. 
Doolittle asserted, and Senators Reverdy Johnson of Maryland and Thomas A. Hendricks of Indiana concurred, that all Indians were subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, so that the phrase, Indians not taxed, would be preferable, but Trumbull and Howard disputed this, arguing that the U.S. government did not have full jurisdiction over Indian tribes, which governed themselves and made treaties with the United States. Moreover, they objected to the phrase, Indians not taxed on the basis that it could be construed as making citizenship dependent on wealth and also that it would allow states to manipulate who is a citizen in their state through tax policy. Topic birthright citizenship The provisions in Section 1 have been interpreted to the effect that children born on United States soil, with very few exceptions, are U.S. citizens. This type of guarantee, legally termed jus soli, or right of the territory, does not exist in most of Europe, Asia or the Middle East, although it is part of English common law and is common in the Americas. Two Supreme Court precedents were set by the cases of Elk v. Wilkins and United States v. Wong Kim Ark. Elk v. Wilkins established that Indian tribes represented independent political powers with no allegiance to the United States, and that their peoples were under a special jurisdiction of the United States. Children born to these Indian tribes therefore did not automatically receive citizenship under the 14th Amendment if they voluntarily left their tribe. Indian tribes that paid taxes were exempt from this ruling, their peoples were already citizens by an earlier act of Congress, and all non-citizen Indians were subsequently made citizens by the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. In Wong Kim Ark the Supreme Court held that, under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, a man born within the United States to foreigners in that case, Chinese citizens who have a permanent domicile and residence in the United States and are carrying on business in the United States and who were not employed in a diplomatic or other official capacity by a foreign power, was a citizen of the United States. More broadly, the court characterized the statement, all persons born in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States as the broad and clear words of the Constitution, ruling that Wang's U.S. citizenship had been acquired by birth and had not been lost or taken away by anything happening since his birth. A 2010 Congressional Research Service report observed that, though it could be argued that Congress has no power to define subject to the jurisdiction and the terms of citizenship in a manner contrary to the Supreme Court's understanding of the Fourteenth Amendment as expressed in Wong Kim Ark and Elk, since Congress does have broad power to pass necessary and proper legislation to regulate naturalization under the Constitution, Art. I, Section 8, CLS. 4 and 18 of the Constitution Congress arguably has the power to define subject to the jurisdiction thereof for the purpose of regulating immigration. Historian Eric Foner has explored the question of birthright citizenship and argues that birthright citizenship stands as an example of the much abused idea of American exceptionalism. Birthright citizenship does make the United States along with Canada unique in the developed world. No European nation recognizes the principle. Topic. Loss of citizenship The Fourteenth Amendment does not provide any procedure for revocation of United States citizenship. Under the Supreme Court precedent of Afroyim v. Rusk, loss of Fourteenth Amendment-based U.S. citizenship is possible only under the following circumstances. Fraud in the naturalization process. Technically this is not loss of citizenship, but rather avoiding of the purported naturalization and a declaration that the immigrant never was a U.S. citizen. Voluntary relinquishment of citizenship. This may be accomplished either through renunciation procedures specially established by the State Department or through other actions e treason, which demonstrate an intention to give up U.S. citizenship. Such an act of expatriation must be accompanied by an intent to terminate United States citizenship, for jus sanguinis U.S. citizenship, i.e., citizenship for the children born abroad of U.S. citizen parents, which is established only by congressional statute and not the U.S. Constitution including its amendments. These restrictions do not apply e.g., C.F. Rogers v. Bellet, 401 U.S. 815, 1971. Right to travel In Scenes v. Roe, the Supreme Court held that this clause protects an aspect of the right to travel. Specifically, the Scenes Court said that the Citizenship Clause protects a citizen's right to resettle in other states and then be treated equally. 
t he citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment expressly equates citizenship with residence. That clause does not provide for, and does not allow for, degrees of citizenship based on length of residence. Zobel, 457 U.S., at 69. It is equally clear that the clause does not tolerate a hierarchy of 45 subclasses of similarly situated citizens based on the location of their prior residence. T. He protection afforded to the citizen by the citizenship clause of that amendment is a limitation on the powers of the national government as well as the states. The Seams Court also mentioned the majority opinion in the Slaughterhouse cases, which had stated that a citizen of the United States can, of his own volition, become a citizen of any state of the Union by a bona fide residence therein, with the same rights as other citizens of that state. Natural-born citizens The Oxford English Dictionary OED at natural born defines it as a person who becomes a citizen at birth as opposed to becoming one later. It lists this definition as going back to the 16th century. OED cites a law of 1695 Act 7 and 8 will. 31696-478 that states, a natural-born subject of this realm, who shall be willing to enter and register himself for the service of his majesty. It also quotes Thomas Jefferson 1776 in T. Jefferson Public Papers 344, all persons who, propose to reside, dot and who shall subscribe the fundamental laws, shall be considered as residents and entitled to all the rights of persons natural-born. Black's Law Dictionary 10th edition defines natural-born citizen as a person born with Within the jurisdiction of a national government, Webster's International Dictionary, third edition, 2000, defines "natural born" as especially having the legal status of citizen or subject. Section one of Article two of the United States Constitution requires that a candidate for president of the United States be a natural born citizen. According to a former edition of the U.S. Department of State Foreign Affairs Manual, the fact that someone is a natural born citizen pursuant to a statute does not necessarily imply that he or she is such a citizen for constitutional purposes, the majority opinion by Justice Horace Gray in United States v. Wong Kim Ark observed that, the Constitution nowhere defines the meaning of these words citizen and natural-born citizen, either by way of inclusion or of exclusion, except insofar as this is done by the affirmative declaration that all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States. This observation by Gray about the term natural-born citizen was obiter dicta, since the case did not involve any controversy about presidential eligibility equals equals notes <laughs>